it's easy to get lost in the story of the Good Samaritan with the hero and the two zeros. You know, we, we, we get ourselves applauding and then shaking our heads and we, we kind of forget that this story actually happens in the middle of a, a conversation that Jesus was having with a person who had asked a really good question. The person had asked, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So when we finally do kind of tune in and listen to this discussion that's actually going on, unfortunately, we immediately tend to assume, oh, oh, I know what's going on here, and I know what should be said in answer to him. You know, oh, I, I get this, I get this. He's wanting to know how to get saved. And I happen to know the answer to that one. Mm -hmm. I've been to the... Uh, Billy Graham School of Evangelism happen to know that when a sinner comes to ask in this question, you're almost home. You know, and the revival preacher's almost done his job. And, and you're just waiting then for, for the words to be said over this man. You know, if you want to be sure, brother, this is what you do. Believe ye in the Lord Jesus Christ and ye shall be saved. You know, we're just, just kind of waiting for that to kind of be there for this man. Well, if, if that had been the actual conversation Jesus was having with this man about his eternal destination, be it heaven or hell, then, you know, that would have been a, a natural way to go. And he might have used a similar conversation that he had with another man who came to him in the middle of the night guy by the name of Nicodemus who wanted to know that very thing. And, and Jesus was very upfront with him and very direct and clear that you have to be born again of the water and of the Spirit. That you have to receive then this, this gift of faith in which you are assured and believe that God so loved the world that He did give His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him has eternal life and will not perish. But this really wasn't the discussion that Jesus was having with the man at all. I mean, it began there, but that's not the focus and where Jesus was actually seeing it was all going to play out. That what Jesus was really hoping to get to was, well, how do you now live in the present moment with God and your neighbor? The master teacher then looking at this expert in the law, perhaps even tongue-in-cheek says, well, you know, you read the Bible, right? Right? Okay, well, how do you see this? How and who has this eternal kind of life with God and their neighbor right now? Now, for those of us who've grown up in the faith, oh, oh, we know answers like this. This is like 101 kind of stuff. And, and the experts among us, we know chapter and verse. Deuteronomy, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Leviticus 19, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Boom, nailed it. You know, I mean, this guy, he slam dunked the answer. And Jesus just kind of had to step back. It's like, whoa, you, you knew that one, didn't you? He had nothing to add to what the man said because it was it is, and it will always be the right and complete answer for how one lives right now with God and their neighbor. To, to love God with all that you are and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's, that's it. But of course, the master teacher, he, he knows that there's, there's more hidden in the heart of this man. And if he just continues the discussion a little bit longer, it's going to pop out because it's, it's, just, it's just right there. Because if you really and honestly believe that life right now is about loving God and loving your neighbor, most human beings then want to know this next question, the follow-up question, and who's my neighbor? Because... It's really an enormous responsibility to love every person all the time. And it's, it's just too big. 
It's, it's too big of an ask, right? And, and to be honest, it's even dangerous. I mean, this, this in-group of people who would be my neighbor that I'm supposed to love certainly would exclude people who are actively seeking to harm me or kill my children, right? And I suppose, you know, we could kind of make sense of that. But we also have this, this gray list, this gray area list that I'm not too sure about. But we're going to go ahead and just err on the side of not loving them. And it's people, you know, that don't deserve our love because they've been mean to us. They've intentionally hurt us. They've done things. And they're not even sorry about it. They're just happy they did it. And... Yeah, you know, and every human being in this room has a list that we have justified to ourselves that is not my neighbor. And we've been learning how to do this from young childhood on. I mean, think about it. You've been there. The, the friend says to the other friend, the little friend, you know, it's like, you're my best friend. A little bit later, the same person comes over to another kid and says, and you're not my friend anymore. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's more than once that our, over at our preschool, we've had to tell the kids, you know, we're all friends here at preschool. We can all play together. And, and it would be kind of cute if it was just something that stayed in the preschool. But we take that on for the rest of our life. And the list grows on and on. So that when we get older, we, we kind of add to our list, you know, people that just aren't very competent at their job. You know, you go to a restaurant and your server's not getting it done. It's like, ooh, that really irks us. And, and then people who've just made a mess of their lives because of their own, you know, sinful choices. And when we really look at our list of people, there's a lot of vanity in it too. Like people that aren't quite as uh, attractive, fit, or healthy as we believe a human being ought to be. Or just people that are too beautiful, too rich, too amazing, right? We add them to the list too. It, the list just keeps going on and on and on. And we know exactly who's on it and who's not. And we fight like mad to make sure we're not on that list. And, and those, there are those people then who will say to you, well, I don't really care what you think about me, okay? But they've just told you to your face that you are not on their list of neighbors. But you know, none of this surprises us. None of this shocks us. Like, oh my gosh, people do that. No, this is normal life, right? And Jesus was well aware that this is exactly how we live our normal life with God and our neighbors. And this is the reason then that he told the story about this, this guy who was left for half dead along the road. He told the story and, and then, you know, any decent human being would hear it and think, well, okay, the moral of this story is to be good like the Samaritan, you know. If you see somebody hurting and broken, you stop whatever you're doing. You sacrifice your time and your money and your effort, and you show compassion, right? And then we just kind of assume, though, that's what's going on here. And, and so the, the expert in the law who was having this discussion with Jesus, he realizes, uh-oh, conversation's over and I have lost this debate as he realizes that he is far less loving than the law of God demands of him and there we find a good place for us to start examining our own hearts you know, what, what does the law of God say to us as we are to love our neighbor? Well, just look at Leviticus 19, 17. It says, Do not hate your fellow Israelite in your heart. Now, it's not a big stretch to kind of paraphrase that, to say, Do not hate your fellow Ascension member, your fellow Wichitan, your fellow Kansan, your fellow American, you know, if, or, or the next verse that says, Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people. Like your people, which would be your family. 
as we are confronted with the holy law of God, we realize that we are far less loving than the law of God demands of us. Because we all have a neighbor list and some people are on and some people are off. And, and just even the very thought that we would actually have to spend an entire 24-hour time period with someone who's on our off list and just have to listen to their, their whining, complaining, their put up with their personal habits, their, their put-downs, their abuse, everything that has put them on our off list, just to spend 24 hours with them would just, it's, it's an awful prospect. And then to think about spending all eternity with them. Oh. But if God's law demands that I love my neighbor, I suppose I'll just have to grit my teeth and do it. Well, if that's how you hear this story and how you hear the laws of love your neighbor and everything from Leviticus, if you just got to grit your teeth and do it, I, as one of your pastors, counsels you very strongly today, don't do it. Yes, you could force yourself to be polite, to be civil, and, and that... That's really nice at church, and that's really nice at school and work. We, we have to do that. But don't fool yourself into believing that somehow this belabored effort to love one another is, is, the fulfill, is fulfilled by this just forcing yourself, even through gritted teeth, to do it. God's law demands that we love one another deeply from the heart. Now I know this is really hard to hear. Not that you can't hear it, but to really consider it truthfully with your own heart. But there's not a person sitting here that it doesn't really dig into. But once you have an honest assessment of what's really here, once you can really see how f truly far you are from God, then, then you can finally hear the, the teacher tell the story of the guy who was left for dead along the road. And you'll hear it not as a morality play. And not as, oh, I should be good like the Samaritan and, and care for people. But you will finally be able to hear and understand that you... And I are actually the man left for dead along the road. Because the law of God has no mercy. Every one of us is laid out. And everything that we've tried to kind of work hard at to, to make ourselves a little more acceptable, a little more loving, it's, it's just walking around us now and ignoring us. But there are is a new set of eyes. A new set of eyes have fallen on us. And they see you. And they see your need. And they see with a great compassion. And the eyes that see you, well, this one now comes to, to serve you. Not because it's the rule and, and he has to, this one has come to sacrifice himself, his time, his, even his own life. Not because he's just gritted his teeth and he's going to be polite to you. This one has come to do everything that is required to restore you to the love of God because inside of his heart is a love that cannot be stopped. This one, it would cost Jesus his very life on a cross. But he was willing to pay that price so that you and I would be restored because you, you are the neighbor. You are the beloved of God. You are the ones to receive his life and forgiveness. And once you're restored into everyday now life with Jesus, 
two big truths come into view and to focus, and they really do run the rest of your life with God. Two key fundamental truths that you really need to have locked in because you're with Jesus. And the first truth is that you and I are far more sinful than we ever thought. And the second truth is that we are far more loved than we ever dared imagine. Far more sinful than you thought. Far more love than you ever dared imagine. Both of these must be before and to lead the way. And as then that they're there, God uses them to work in your heart a true humility and a peace. A humility that gives you eyes to see the other people left half dead in the road of life. And you can see them not with a heart that is contemptuous and hates them and resents them and why can't they just be different? But a heart that truly is like Jesus of compassion. And then seeing them with the eyes of compassion through the power of Jesus who is with you in the presence of Jesus, you're moved then with a compassion and to actually join Jesus in being a neighbor to those who are left for dead on the road. Not because you have to, it's the rule, but because God has made you a completely new heart in Jesus heart of compassion like his. You see, what Jesus was really after wasn't to give you a list of, well, who's the neighbor, who's in and out, but he's really after to make you a neighbor so that whoever comes before you, whether they deserve it or not, will have a handout for you to take home today. It's on the table as you leave. And it's a prayer for the weak. As you live with these true realities, you're far more sinful than you thought and you're far more loved than you dared imagine. To lift up this prayer, Jesus, lead me in, in loving my neighbor. Give me eyes to see my neighbor. Compassion to care for their needs and a willingness to act. Take the card home. Put it before your heart. Keep the two truths because they give you hope and they give you humility and they give you peace and the Lord works in all of this so that you can be a neighbor. Amen. We stand. We confess.